Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Mean Tweets on Tech First with Light Matter CEO Nick Harris. Of course, I am mostly joking. Months ago, we had Nick on Tech First. We chatted about his photonic supercomputer using light to vastly accelerate computing performance. The video has almost 400,000 views on YouTube and 2,500 comments. And we thought it'd be kind of fun to go through the comments, some of the nice ones, some of the mean ones, some of the tough ones, and get Nick to answer them. So welcome, Nick. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. Good to be back. Hey, super happy to have you. You've got some guts. I uh, hope you're ready for this. Maybe before we dive into all those tweets, uh, give us a quick update on what Light Matters Photonic Computer is for those who didn't watch the first video. Yeah, so Light Matter is building a photonic compute chip it's targeted at running artificial intelligence algorithms at extremely high speeds and using very little energy. It's a completely new type of computer, uh, and we're really excited to bring it to market. Excellent. And you recently had some new news, some pretty exciting news as well. Yeah, so uh, we raised an $80 million Series B round, and the goal with that money is to fund go-to-market with our product. Uh, it's called Invise, and it's our first-generation photonic compute accelerator. Uh, we've been hiring a bunch of people on the business side uh, with that money and, and really focused on bringing this thing to the world. Nice. And uh, there's some big names among those investors, including Google Ventures, correct? Yeah. So Google Ventures, uh, GV, as they're called now, participated in the round along with all of our existing investors and, and some new ones, uh, including Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Excellent. So let me share the original video here and we will just go through some of those tweets and see what we see. Here's one that's actually interesting from no art. I'd be really interested in to know how it actually works. I have some understanding of transistors and logic gates, but I can't understand how you'd actually do linear algebra with light. What's your answer, Nick? Yeah, so we can understand uh, some of the basic operations. Linear algebra, if you look at it uh, as, a, as a class of problems, you're doing multiplication and addition. That's, that's really it. So if you can do multiplication and addition, you can do linear algebra. Um, how do you do it with light? What we do is we use a device called a modulator, or what one can do. There are many ways to build photonic computers. And what a modulator does is incoming light comes into the modulator, and it goes out the other side. Um, you can actually apply a voltage or a current, an electrical signal to that modulator and attenuate the brightness of the light, for example, or you can apply a phase shift to the light, uh, proportional to the, the signal that you're applying to the modulator. Um, so, so really think about it like, if you wanna do multiplication, you apply a, an electrical signal to a modulator and it imparts that data on the optical stream. Uh, and so let's say you wanted to multiply two numbers. You could have two modulators in series as an example. So one followed by another connected directly to each other. You'd apply a value here that's B and a value here that's A. And the value at the end of this thing would be B times A. Uh, addition can be done in sort of a similar manner. Uh, one way that you could do it would be by taking a bunch of different uh, waveguides, for example, and then putting them all into a single waveguide. So shining a bunch of lights into a single, into a single channel. Uh, this would give you addition. There are a lot of different ways to do addition, but there's multiply and there's add. Hopefully it makes sense. It's all about modulators. Very, very interesting. By the way, we learned a lot about ourselves in the first video. We, we learned that I say very interesting a lot. So we're going to just repeat that. <laughs> if it is interesting, I'm going to say it. And apparently you say, what was your phrase? Yeah, so is that correct? Yeah, so. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, well, let's go with random guy. Will it run Doom? Will it run Doom? You know, what we're focused on right now is not graphics, but we know that linear algebra uh, as a class of, of computation can be used for doing graphics processing. I see a future not too far away where light matter could support things like ray tracing and, and rendering and, and things like this. So uh, hopefully soon. I love gaming, would love to be able to play in that space. <laughs> I was going to say very interesting. I, I, I was not going to say very interesting. I said very interesting. 
Well, you know, hey, Max White said almost the same thing right here. I think the top two things for me are gaming and rendering. You mentioned it's good at ray tracing. It's perfect for both. So he said it's exciting. I think the reality here is though that you're, you're probably not going to be able to find this in Best Buy, right? <laughs> this is not probably where you're going with this chip right away. Yeah, we're focusing on selling this to enterprises, to, to big businesses. Um, I would love to see a future where consumers found use cases that were compelling from a business perspective, where maybe you'd be able to go to Best Buy and buy a light matter card. But for right now, we're really targeting uh, very large companies that are deploying artificial intelligence. Uh, hopefully there, there are markets going forward where individuals might want to deploy this kind of hardware. Exactly. And there might be some individuals in those very large companies who just want to play Doom on them as well. So that may be coming. This one's very interesting from Weehe, and he brings up, now we can literally say that RGB improves performance, which kicked off an entire debate, which I was unaware of. I mean, I know the GIF GIF, right? But I was not aware that there is a big internet debate over CMYK, right? Which is, um, well, RGB is red, blue, green, or CMYK is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. K is the black. Uh, <laughs> CMYK is much more from the print world, of course. RGB is from your from your monitors. Uh, settle the debate for us. Is it CMYK, CMYK or RGB? Well, if, if I had to choose between those, I would say RGB. Uh, but I think what they're talking about is if you look at gaming computers today, like if you go to Newegg or one of these websites that sells components for building gaming computers, almost all mm -hmm. of the lights, they'll have LEDs where you can customize what color the fans in the computer are or the mouse or the keyboard. Um, so I think they're, the joke, the way that I took it is, uh, you know, we can actually process on multiple colors at the same time with Light Matters technology, and it actually makes it faster. Uh, whereas it's sort of, uh, you know, like a boondoggle or a toy right now that you can have red, green, or blue on uh, mouse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now I understand. Excellent. Uh, there's another joke about Yasso. Um, <laughs> we'll skip that one. Uh, Faustin says linear algebra is a Swiss, the, the math Swiss army knife of computer science, which is cool. And then there's a bunch like these and they got quite a few responses as well, right? We need to see proof that this hardware really does what it says it does in real world situations. We hear a lot of hype heard from a lot of startups it's mostly talks so we have james andrew and jack right here i'll wait till they actually have something i mean yeah. on the one hand it's really good because you just raised 80 million dollars from google and others that's they don't throw 80 million dollars away i mean it's not like they get it right every time but that's that's a, that's that's a proof point uh, what do you say in response to people like that yeah, so I can tell you a bit about the backstory of Light Matter. So I did my doctorate and a postdoc at MIT. And while I was there, I built the first systems that did this kind of linear algebra with silicon photonics. And that's the platform that Light Matter builds its technology on. Um, so that technology has been published in Nature, Nature Physics, Nature Photonics, all the top journals in academia. It's peer reviewed. It works. That's how I got the first funding run from Matrix and Spark. Um, at Light Matter, we've built a series of chips. Uh, the way that we get the money is by showing the investors these things working. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but it's all, it's proven technology. <laughs> you know, I mean, if I'm investing $80 million, I'm going to be pretty bloody sure that I've had my hands on an actual piece of hardware, done some testing, had my geeks look at it and verify that it is correct. This episode of Tech First is sponsored by my creator coin, Dollar Smart. Don't think of it like Bitcoin. Think of it like a backstage pass at a concert. Get some at rally.io slash creator slash SMRT to pitch me on podcast guests, earn weekly rewards, get social amplification, and get or give feedback on strategy and plans. Here's an interesting comment from Valtteri. I won't try the last name. Uh, commenting about this general purpose AI accelerator comment that you've had. He says, is that what we're calling matrix multiplication now? Still a big deal, of course, but I find marketing speak funny. <laughs> Do you find marketing speak funny or is it not marketing speak? Yeah, so I think in a sense it is marketing speak. What The technology that we built accelerates linear algebra, but uh, 
what we're building at Light Matter as a system, as, as an entire chip and a solution is an artificial intelligence accelerator that can be applied to any type of AI. Uh, so that's what I mean by general purpose AI acceleration. If we didn't, if we got rid of all the software stacks, our software stack is called Idiom, throw that away, uh, throw away the, the ASIC architecture and some of the other features in the chip, then yeah, it's just linear algebra. But there's a ton of work and a ton of intellectual property that wraps around that thing that makes it into an AI accelerator rather than just a linear algebra chip. Nice, nice, excellent. So uh, somebody liked me. Uh, my questions are top notch. That's great. Somebody liked you as well. We'll, we'll skim over that really, really quickly. Um, there's somebody else who is skeptical, but here's a good question. And this is about the locate dialectic problem. Johnson Savard says, my understanding about photonic computers, they solve that problem. Light beams pass by each other side by side. Don't cause capacitance problems slowing each other down. Is that the right way of thinking about it? Is there another way of thinking about it? How do you respond to that? Okay, so um, there are many contributors to energy consumption in computers today. Capacitance as a category is, is one of the biggest. You can think of a capacitor as sort of a well that you have to dump electrons into. And then once it fills up, you're, you're like, you know, ready to go. So it's, it's this very annoying property. Uh, so that's the general idea. Now, where do you find capacitors? You find them in the wires that connect everything on chips and they slow the communications down a ton and dissipate a ton of power. You also find them in the transistor itself. Um, so CMOS, a complementary metal oxide semiconductor, is built on this idea of a MOS cap, uh, cap being a capacitor. Um, and dielectrics and their dielectric constant K uh, modulate the performance of that transistor. As transistors were shrunk, we had to find higher K dielectrics. Uh, they went to hafnium, and there's probably more exotic things at this point, but I'm not up to date on the materials. And yes, they're challenging, but I don't think as much uh, it's in the transistor world, it's not as much about the, the dielectric constant K as it is about the atomic thinness of that dielectric at this point. Uh, so it's an important piece. I think light matter is solving the interconnect part where the wires are really taking a ton of energy because of their capacitance. And we're also getting rid of the MOS cap, that capacitor, in doing the computation. And, and so that's a huge chunk of energy that you get rid of. Nice, nice. Uh, so we have some others, a little, a little more fun. Instead of thermal throttling, we'll have darkness throttling. I'm, I'm, that, that's facetious. We won't get into that. Um, exactly. You know, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Somebody else wants more technical details. That is exactly what you're doing today. That's great. Uh, somebody here, hey, you're hiring. They're doing a PhD in photonics. That's wonderful. Somebody wants to run crisis. Same answer as doom. Excellent. Excellent. Somebody else who is skeptical. Great. The 80 million might help with that, but you've got some work to do. This one is actually interesting, and that is in Cyrillic, the name, so I won't mention that, but I guess this is the next company that NVIDIA is going to buy. And what's interesting there is I recently just released a video uh, about Hypergator AI, which is a new supercomputer at the University of Florida. It's ranked 22nd globally for supercomputers. It's AI focused, and it's built with NVIDIA chips. Yeah. Interesting thing is, and I don't think the NVIDIA rep that was on the call wanted that to be said, but the provost of the University of Florida said that they spun it up to top speed just recently, has a ton of cooling and air conditioning, and it took 1.1 megawatts of power to run. And it is a room-sized system. This is an old-school big computer that you buy a big building and put in there. Uh, so I don't know that NVIDIA is going to buy you, and I don't know if they want to, but comment a little bit on what supercomputers look like today and what they might look like as you reach maturity and ship. Yeah, so, you know, you've seen a lot of press recently, like Intel announced Ponte Vecchio, uh, and w in their showing that new chip, they were showing the water cooling that's absolutely required for it because it's a 600-watt chip. So you've got water pipes running into the chips. You imagine a supercomputer built out of these kinds of things. There's water everywhere. At the same time, you're seeing Microsoft talking about immersion cooling, where they literally take baths of apparently edible, feel free to look it up on YouTube, uh, coolant. <laughs> it, it's like an organic coolant 
uh, and they dip the cards in this. And then basically as they heat up, they generate bubbles that cool, cool the system. So you're seeing a lot of water being used and a lot of liquid phase cooling. That's all about heat, trying to get the heat out of the chips and making it so that they can still get reasonable compute density. Because with just air, you'd really have to space things out a bunch. So what is the data center like uh, with light matter? You get rid of the water. You, you, know, you don't need it. A lot higher compute density, uh, more compute per energy footprint. It means that, you know, not that I'd want them to do this, but they could reproduce that system uh, at the University of Florida using a lot less of our chips than NVIDIA's and, and save power at money. Uh, but we prefer to upgrade it so that it's faster. <laughs> the plumber's union will not be happy. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of plumbing that goes on and water that goes on and other things like that. Okay. Back to the comments here. Uh, awesome interview. Very good questions. Great answer. So there's some kudos for you as well. That's great. Somebody wants to process local weather on it in real time. Maybe who knows? I don't know about local and probably won't be in your room. Other person is waiting for a shadow based processor. I'm sure it could be invented. There's people who will do all kinds of crazy things. And 740 people liked that comment. Um, I wanted to, ah, this was kudos to the CEO for not selling as a thing that will change everything as is often done with new technologies. He knows his strengths, isn't afraid to admit the current shortcomings. That's a great comment there. Uh, here's one that's interesting. Let's get into this one. This is from Shinemo. Imagine having a PC with quantum processors as your CPU and light processors as your GPU. That would be Cray fast. I'm guessing that's crazy, but Cray is kind of interesting given Cray supercomputers. Hope we get there in a few more decades. Talk about that a little bit in terms of where you see. I know that your computer interfaces with standard computers quite well. In fact, it's built in, it's working together. What about with quantum uh, computers? Yeah, so uh, my PhD was focused on quantum computing. I, I think that it's brilliant and it will change the world, but it's going to take quite a while. Um, so it's going to be, in my opinion, something like 10, 20 years before there's even an opportunity for a light matter chip to be next to a quantum computer that's at scale. Um, I think that quantum computers are really targeted at, at very specific applications. I would encourage anybody watching the video to go to nist.gov. They maintain a document that shows all of the different computational problems that quantum computers are known to speed up. Uh, and so this is vetted by scientists like legit people in the field. And there's, there are papers that back up these results. What you'll find when you look at that list is like, it's not going to run crisis. So it's not going to be your CPU. Uh, to be clear, it is Turing complete and Turing complete means yes, the quantum computer could run crisis, but it would be an awful waste of that incredible hardware. You'd be better served uh, doing database search with Grover's algorithm or, or any number of other things, maybe even cracking some RSA uh, with Shor's algorithm. Very interesting. There I go. I said it again. We need some more end souls from you just to keep the uh, peanut gallery happy here. This is a very interesting comment. This, of course, is the type of comment that your PR department warns you about and says, hey, don't comment on that, something like that. So, you know, use your own judgment here. From Swedish Death Lamb, I love your name. At CES a decade ago, NVIDIA had a small demo of their own research into optical computing. Obviously, no sales at that point, but the engineer was talking about it. One of the most interesting things forever. So happy to see this tech come to market. Talk about competition in the space. Why has NVIDIA not come out with something here? Why have others not come out with something here? Why has it taken a decade? And how are you guys so uh, advanced in this particular area compared to others? Yeah, so first of all, I would say that we need competition. We need a lot of people working on this, similar to what Elon did with open sourcing the patents for Tesla. Uh, his goal there was to try to drive adoption of electric vehicles because he knew there was a mismatch between the tech that Tesla had and what other people had. I sort of view our industry the same way. The problem we're trying to solve is really big. We're the first company that's in the space. Since we were founded, there have been about nine other companies working in this. And yes, there have been press releases from Intel on them working on some form of, of optical computing. I'm not aware of NVIDIA doing anything on it, but I do know some of the executive team there. And uh, let's just say lots of people are interested in, in this kind of field. And I widely encourage people to look into it. I think it's important. Excellent. Excellent. 
I skimmed over a bunch while you were answering that. I love this Star Trek nerd here going, ooh, photonic. Yeah, a lot of us are like that. Uh, Madras 61 understood it's for deep learning, cloud computing, data centers, and big companies. Uh, this is an interesting comment from Christian Reinich. Um, running a photon pro pro processor on different light waves is a real step towards 3D processing. Any comments about 3D processing? Uh, yeah, so I, what, I, what I'm taking that to mean is like our brain is a 3D computer chip, if you will. Like it's not just like layers of neurons, they're all connected in 3D in a volume. So when you use different colors in a light matter processor, what it does is it creates a, another virtual processor on top of, of your current one for the same resource cost of the base layer. Another color gives you another layer. And so you can kind of build up a whole like queue of compute uh, that's composed of the different colors of light passing through the core. So yeah, maybe it's, it's like 3D. Uh, I could go really geeky and talk about the interconnect that would need to go between those sheets, but I won't. Interesting. Uh, there I did it again. Yep. <laughs> I can't help it. If I think it's interesting, I say it. Uh, there's uh, somebody who wants a yes so counter in the top right. So maybe we'll do a version like that. Uh, another one with interesting as well. Maybe two counters. There we go. This is a great comment from Daniel Lee. My ex-wife invited some friends over for dinner in 96. One of them was an MIT grad student. He said at the time they were a couple decades out. Well, you know, he seemed pretty close. That is a great comment. Here's one from the photovoltaic man. Great name. How many different colors could you run through a core? Every nanometer of wavelength, every 12, 20, 50, et cetera. I'm going to like that comment because it's a great one. What's your answer? Yeah, so the number of colors depends on your ability to separate them. Uh, so separation of colors usually happens with a wavelength division multiplexer. And if you look at data centers today, they're, they're a prism, is it? It is. It literally is. Okay. Yeah. And you can do it with another device called a resonator. But there are some standards on this. There's coarse wavelength division multiplexing and dense wavelength division multiplexing. In coarse, you have a lot more spacing in nanometers between the colors. And in dense, you have a lot less spacing. Uh, so how many colors could you do? I think we can leverage the same exact laser infrastructure that people are using for telecom. And they're currently looking at 16 and 32 colors. It's not ready yet, but I think that's like a pretty reasonable spot to go. And that's a heck of a lot of compute if you've got that many colors going on. Very, very impressive. I think we're almost running out of the great, great questions and comments here. I'm sure there's other ones that we won't see, but these are some of the later ones. They don't have as many comments. Uh, this is, <laughs> I gotta love this. James Watson counted how many questions were asked. 22, eight questions were yes, no, 20 were answered with the yeah, so. So, um, you know, th this is the internet. Um, <laughs> people have time on their hands to do things like that with questions and answers. I just want to say, uh, thanks for, uh, sitting in for the first interview. That was a lot of fun. And I did indeed think it was very interesting, uh, but I also appreciate this time. Um, you've gone deeper, you've gone more technical uh, in response to those questions. So we'll see if uh, people like that and what are the questions they have. As you release, of course, I want to know, I want to hear, I want to see it. I believe your original timetable when we talked a couple months ago was something coming to market later this year. Uh, a, am I correct? And B, um, are you on track for that? Yeah, so we were targeting end of this year. Um, building chips is really hard. It's gonna be next year, or hopefully middle of next year. So that that's where we're headed. Okay. And okay. Is this is this feature creep or is this just, it's really freaking hard? Uh, you know, it's it's running a massive engineering organization and, and managing timelines and all these sorts of things. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty challenging stuff. If you look at timelines that are predicted by companies like NVIDIA and Intel, it's constantly the case that they're not able to nail the, the time. So it's just hard stuff. Yep, it is hard stuff. And we, we have read the mythical man month, of course. And so the infusion of capital doesn't always help. Um, adding more people doesn't always help. Uh, in any case, uh, Nicholas, thank you again for taking this time. Do appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, John.